Um, so welcome all to Theology on Tap. Uh, thank you for finding your way to a different night and a different bar. Um, it's fun to do things different every once in a while. Um, thank you to those of you who've never been tonight. For those of you who don't know, Theology on Tap is a gathering facilitated by some Episcopal churches in St. Louis, Holy Communion where I work, Holy Trinity in the Central West End, and still the Cathedral downtown. Uh, we get together to talk about topics about life, spirituality, politics, and bars. Uh, we normally do it on the first Tuesday of the month, but Noah was in town on a Sunday, so we decided to do it on a Sunday. Um, and those who want to stick around tonight, uh, we will be going down to the bar to watch the debate. Um, so Noah and I have known each other for about a decade. And I met Noah the first time, uh, I was saying I was in a van with a group from the Diocese of San Diego. It was my second trip down to El Salvador. And we had to stop by the side of the road in this podunk town in the middle of nowhere. And this guy that was like covered in dust from the road and like had grease stains all over his pants climbs in and just starts talking about El Salvador and justice and life. And it's been 10 years and I've never heard Noah stop talking about El Salvador and justice and life. Um, and so I was delighted to have him come up to St. Louis and do that for a weekend here. Um, Noah works for an organization called Christosol. Um, when Noah started working for Christosol, you were the only employee for a long time, right? Jose. Yeah, oh, Jose. So he had he had one employee, um, and now there's 28 people working for Christosol, and there's about to be a whole lot more. Um, they're doing all sorts of work in El Salvador around human rights, migration, um, and refugees. And I'm going to let Noah talk about that a lot more. So please help me welcome Noah Bullock. So uh, Mike told me we're not going to do introductions right here. Later, later you'll introduce yourselves to each other at your tables in the uh, small working groups. Um, but I'm curious, how many people are here because of a connection with Holy Communion? Raise your hand. Well, a lot of you. Jim Lockett? And then others? <laughs> you guys. Okay, good. Well, I want to be responsive to the things that you're interested in. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about our work in El Salvador, uh, and then I'm going to try and talk about human rights with you. Um, but if you have questions, uh, I hope you interrupt and ask them, and, and that way we guide our conversation towards things that are relevant and interesting to you all. Um, so, this was all we're a human rights organization in El Salvador. Uh, I think that we're unique uh, in that we were founded by the Anglican Bishop. So we're an organization that was founded within sort of the Episcopal Church. Uh, and I think that we're unique even among organizations that were founded there because we have a specific human rights mandate. Uh, so our mission is to advance human rights in Central America through research, learning, and rights-based programming. Uh, and we have three programs. We have one that's called the Center for Research and Learning where we do research with academic partners and also other uh, human rights organizations. Right now we're doing research about the impacts of violence on normal human, uh, community development processes. Uh, we're also beginning research uh, about forced disappearances, which is an emerging issue that we've uh, begun to detect in some of our casework. And we've also done research on LGBT rights uh, and hate crimes in El Salvador. So those are kind of our three primary research Right, or, uh, focuses right now. We also, in that same program, offer week-long seminars in El Salvador on uh, human rights issues. So we've done. As I say, human rights, I'm in. So we've done uh, courses on rights-based development. We've done courses on forced displacement by violence. Uh, recently, we did one on climate change and displacement. Um, and it's an opportunity for us to share our work with people from North America, but also the model is really uh, exchange and mutual formation with Salvadorans. So on these courses, you're joined with Salvadorans for the entire week. And, and the learning is supposed to be a mutual experience. We think that's important uh, because human rights has really always been an international issue uh, and an international conversation about how we fundamentally think that we should treat each other. Um, the other program we have is a community development program where we provide training to municipalities, municipal governments, and community leaders where they come together uh, and we talk about citizen participation, 
Uh, we talk about rights-based development, and then we provide technical assistance to those groups as they implement rights-based development processes. So this is what our program, it's kind of our dreamy one about, uh, we, we hope to contribute to the construction of a more democratic society at the local government level. Uh, Salvador, for people who, who know a little bit about the region, is a, is a country that for most of its history has been governed by authoritarian governments. So we have a very short history of democracy. I think that the learning that we've done is that signing a peace agreement that allows people to vote doesn't change the social fabric. Uh, and those things have to be learned, those new skills uh, and, and institutional capacities. And then our third program is the one that gets us in trouble, the one that I usually have to talk about the most. Uh, it's a program where we provide direct assistance to the victims of human rights violations and serious crimes. And so specifically, our, our focus right now is on forced displacement by violence. Uh, El Salvador last year was the most violent country in the world. There were 6,670 homicides. Um, collectively with, the, with Honduras and Guatemala, the Northern Triangle, there were 15,700 homicides, which makes it one of the most violent regions in the world. The only other places in the world where you can find rates of violent death that are comparative are in Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And so you have, just on the basis of the indicators of, or, or, or the rates of violent death, uh, you have the indicator of a serious humanitarian crisis almost immediately south of our border. And that's been the primary piece of our advocacy this year. Uh, we've had the opportunity to be a part of different processes with the United Nations. Uh, I was able to speak at the uh, World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul at the High Level Roundtable on Displacement. Uh, we were part of the regional meetings uh, and the consultations running up to the United Nations General Assembly meeting last or in September a few weeks ago. Uh, and our, our mission has been to remind the world as we consider our global refugee crisis that there's a refugee and humanitarian crisis here in the Western Hemisphere. This is something that even North Americans are not familiar with. Uh, we, it's hard to change a narrative, and the narrative that we have had for a long time is that people from the South come to our country to look for jobs. Uh, some of our colleagues, for example, in Mexico that run shelters that were founded mostly through religious orders to assist migrants, Central American migrants moving to Mexico to the United States, uh, they said there was a specific moment when they realized they were no longer providing services for migrants, but they were providing services for refugees, and their programs had to change. Uh, and so it's people who have been directly in contact with the victims, uh, it's evident that we have a humanitarian and refugee situation, but that's a difficult story to tell outside, because it means we have to almost reprogram the way that, that we're all understanding migration in, in Mesoamerica. Um, I think that our, well, not our adversaries, but our, the people who detract from this narrative in the government of El Salvador, for example, would say that migration is, there are multiple causes to migration, and I don't think that that's incorrect. I think that's true. I think that, that the decisions for families to decide to abandon their livelihoods and homes usually has multiple factors. But the underlying factor for people in the most violent country in the world is violence. And that's something that we've been able to document in our own case studies. Uh, we, as an organization, um, sort of founded a civil society roundtable in El Salvador, where uh, 15 or human rights organizations have come together to work and build uh, joint adv advocacy efforts to the Salvadoran government, because the Salvadoran government doesn't recognize forced displacement by violence. They deny that violence is a driver of immigration internally or externally. Um, and with that group, we've also built an observatory, in which we've documented over a thousand individual cases of displacement since August of 2014. So that's the largest register of displacement by violence in the Northern Triangle. And what we've, what we've detected in a small sample that, that we were able to process uh, this year of about 155 people is that 85% of the people who had livelihoods before the displacement event lost them as a result of it. And then similarly, 65% of the children who were studying before the displacement event were no longer studying as a result of having been displaced. 
so the reasons why people end up leaving the country may be that they are looking for jobs, maybe that they're looking for education, but also they were denied access to those things as a consequence of the violence that's happening in El Salvador. It doesn't mean that there is an economic migration, but it is important to understand that protection is a critical part of the way we need to respond to immigration, forced immigration specifically from the region. Uh, we have 55,000 Salvadorans were deported from Mexico last year, and we've, there's this scenario now where the world is debating about migrants and refugees. And we say that these people are refugees, and these people are migrants, and then we have this third new category of people that were not able to get international protection, yet can't be sent home because they have special protection needs. And that's the problem that we're dealing with now. How many of the 55,000 people who were deported back to El Salvador have founded fears, fundamentally can't go back to the places of origin? So these are, this is a little bit of a, an overview of, of our work and, and the scenario uh, that we're dealing with in El Salvador. I wanted to kind of, I didn't want to talk at you about our work all night. I wanted to engage us in more of a conversation about human rights themselves. Uh, and I think it's an important issue for us to talk about because my assessment or my conclusion after having spent several meetings at the United Nations and, and been a part of an international dialogue is that there's been a paradigm shift. The international system that was set up after World War II was set up based on, a human, on human rights as principles that should guide the conversations that we have among us. Uh, and the, if you look at the preamble of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it says that the barbarous acts and atrocities that we committed, referring mostly to World War II, have shocked the conscience of mankind. And we now fundamentally think that the foundations of peace and security are fundamental respect for human dignity and rights. So human rights were proposed to, as, a, as a model for the international system, as a security model. We thought that respecting people and their rights was a way that made everybody safer. And we see at an international level, and we see that in our own country, that we're stepping away from that. We feel that we're not safer by respecting people's rights, we're safer by closing off borders. We feel that we're not safer by increasingly respecting rights of, of people, but militarizing our police system. Uh, so there's a trend that's happening globally and it's happening in St. Louis and it's happening in our own country, to backing away from this idea that respecting people's rights is good for me because it's good for you. And if it's good for you, we're all safer. Um, so I wanted to ask you all, what are human rights? We talk about it and sometimes we don't really take the time to define it. Usually when I ask this question, I bring a copy of the Universal Declaration and I'll look at it. But what are human rights? Somebody, raise your hand or shout it out. What, what do you think human rights are? Right to the basic assembly of necessities to survive um, physically and emotionally. Now who has human rights? Everyone should have. Why? Well, I think it'd be a logical reason. <laughs> That's a good reason? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, because we were all created by God, we're all God's creatures, we're all... We are all in that relationship to God as the creator and each other as equal creation. You said we're all equal creation, but when I look around the world, I don't, I don't see evidence that we are actually all equals. Are we all equals? Why do you think that? Anybody, why do you think, why do we think that we're all equals?
an ideal? Where do human rights come from? Any, any other ideas? Are they laws? Do they come from laws? No. Why not? They should be protected by laws. They should be protected by laws. Any other ideas? Endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Yes. <laughs> That's usually where I go with this. Yeah. <laughs> you said that they're ideals. You said that they're religious beliefs. You said uh, that they were ideas. Uh, That's all right. Human rights are not scientifically provable. That was when, when natural law was first proposed in the Enlightenment. The criticism was just that. You know, it'd be, it, it, they were saying to the people, these new philosophers, they were saying, you know, if you were a biologist and you had an idea, or you believed that an animal exists but you couldn't prove it, you don't get to invent the new animal. Literally, they said, you know, natural law, the idea that people endowed by their creator or people by the very virtue of just being human had certain rights, was not provable. That was not even empirical. And so, human rights are convictions. They're beliefs. Their visions, their fundamental, their visions that people have when they look around the world that they live in, and they see how human beings are treating each other, and they imagine how it ought to be. And so that's the important part of that is that they aren't laws. That actually they precede law. They're in that sense they're claimable in any context independently of what the legal construct of that society might be. So, for example, in apartheid South Africa, the legal system doesn't give rights to equal rights to uh, the black population. Yet, human rights would give them the right to claim equality independently of the legal structure. Does that make sense? And that's the power that human rights have. It's a moral power. And somebody else, you said they're social constructs, and we all agree on them. And when they become universal norms or international standards, that becomes a powerful thing to claim, to appeal to. It becomes difficult for governments to say, uh, no, actually, we do have the right to summarily execute people, because we've already said collectively we don't believe that. But I'm going back to my first point. We actually have governments now that do say that. El Salvador's government's one of them. Two or three days ago, uh, the human rights ombudsman, when questioned about extrajudicial executions, of which there have been 700 documented by the government itself in the last 20 months, said that, yeah, but there are less summary executions than there have been in other moments in, in our past. Or in the Philippines, you have a president that says, if I have to kill as many drug addicts as the Nazis did Jews, I will. And this is evidence of what I was saying to you earlier, is the importance of right now reaffirming human rights principles in our communities, in our country, and internationally. The UN General Assembly meetings, the political document that was ultimately signed to address large movements of migrants and refugees, is a political document that is below the existing standard of protection established in international humanitarian and refugee law already. Meaning that we didn't even come in at par for course. They say that if we were all to sit down at the UN again and sign the Universal Declaration for Human Rights, we wouldn't be able to today. So I think this is what I'm trying to say now is that it's important for us to gain fluency about human rights. It's important for people of faith, for people, community leaders, to reaffirm these principles, that we're all fundamentally equal in dignity and worth. And not only that, that, it's in, that human rights and respect for human rights is the way that we think that we can become safer as a society or as an international community. And that's one of Crystal South's premises, our work. People ask me, El Salvador is the most violent country in the world, what do you think you should do about it? And I don't really have a perfect prescription that's gonna change that scenario overnight, but I do believe that over the long term, respecting human rights and protecting people will transform conflicts. It will transform society and make it ultimately more safe and secure. Politically, that's the difficult thing to run on because in four or five years as president, you're not gonna be able to deliver on that, which is why it's important for us as a society or as a collective to believe in it, to allow politicians 
to run on a human rights platform. So I think we have some questions. Yeah. Here, right? That's my 15 minutes of fame. That's your 15 minutes of fame. <laughs> um, so the all jam tap, what we do is we let the speaker go for a little bit, and then we want the tables to talk. So on your table, you'll find sheets of paper, turn them right side up. There's intentionally not one for every person, so you have to share and talk to each other. Um, but here are your three questions for tonight. And there's really more than three, but there's sort of three topic areas. Number one, at the time when your grandparents were born, were human rights respected? What rights weren't respected? Where were your grandparents born? Uh, number two, since the time your parents were born, has there been progress on human rights? Why? Who made that progress? Number three, what role can faith or spirituality play in determining what is a human right? Can you imagine a church or a religious movement involved in working for human rights? Uh, so you'll have about the next 20, 25 minutes to talk about that. Um, talk amongst yourselves. We're not going to police, you know, we're not going to tell you move on to question two. You know, let, let the spirit lead you. Go where you will with this. We'll come back as a big group, talk about it, and do some question and answer with Noah.